I want, I'm very honored to be able to welcome Rabbi Francis Nataf to our Kehla. Rabbi Nataf is a scholar living in Yerushalayim. He is a translator of many scholarly works from, uh, uh, from Hebrew into English. He writes articles for different venues. And uh, he was very active in the, um, uh, the Cardoza Academy as well for a number of years. Um, he's one of those uh, really provocative thinkers in the Orthodox Jewish world and is uh, worth your while to listen to. So please give him your attention. We should have some handouts in just a few minutes for you. Thank you, Rabbi Nata. Thank you. All right, good evening. It's nice to be back in Toronto. It's been a few years, and uh, I always seem to come here during the winter. So I, I thought I would uh, you know, arrange to come here in the spring, and Baruch Hashem, today was a spring day. So uh, I understand that's not, uh, that's not always the case. <laughs> it could be the only one this week. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in any case, it's good to be here. Um, I also have a history with, with the Bayit. Um, I was actually here the first year, uh, I remember when the doors not quite put on the uh, hinges and, and there was sawdust all over the place. So, uh, um, so, so this, this place has a connection for me that uh, dates from a long time. In any case, I wanted to share some ideas about Sfirat Omer, And uh, part of the reason is that it's a period of time in the Jewish calendar when I think we're very confused. Um, Jews are always sort of not 100% sure of what's going on. Um, you know, there's the joke about the uh, Jewish astronaut who comes down as, as, because he's orbiting the Earth all the time. He's, he's constantly davening mincha, marv, chakrit, and you know, it's, it, it, it's confusing. The Jewish year and the Jewish uh, uh, life cycle are confusing, but I think Sfirat Omer is particularly confusing. Um, there's a lot of things that happen that don't seem to gel so well. Um, obviously, there's Pesach and Shavuot. Uh, Lag Omer is confusing because it's really two things in one. Uh, there's no such thing as a coincidence, but things that are ostensibly related, but not directly so. And that's the end of the plague of Rabbi Akiva students, which we're going to talk about. And the fact that Rav Shem Bar Yochai's life also ended that day, but whereas one is the end of a tragic time and just marks the end of, as we mark the end of Avelut, we're not happy at the end of Avelut. It's simply the end of a dark time. On the other hand, the Hilula, the yard site of someone like Rav Shem Bar Yochai, is, is a happy time. We celebrate Rav Shem Bar Yochai's life, and that's what all the bonfires are about. Um, so you have one day that's sort of two things in one. Um, and then uh, the holidays that have come in modern times, corresponding to the state of Israel primarily, Yom Zikaron, uh, which is a sad day, and uh, Yom Hatzmot and Yom Yerushalayim, which are happy days. Right? We also have Yom HaShoah. So are we coming or are we going? Are we happy? Are we sad? Are we both? Um, I think some of us feel confused or conflicted about exactly how we're supposed to feel. So I'm going to start addressing this issue by asking you a question. It's obviously a trick question, but you can go ahead and answer it anyway. Um, and my question is, how many days is a Jewish holiday? It's not a joke. It's a, it's a legitimate question. So you're looking at me straight. What's he talking about? Right, it depends which holiday you're talking about. Some are one or two in Chutz Laaretz, meaning Shavuot. Some are seven. Some are eight. Um, so my contention is, based on the Ramban, which we'll see and some of you might have heard of, that really all Jewish holidays are eight days. Um, how does that work? How, how do I make such a uh, bold proclamation against the calendar if the calendar tells us that three holidays that have different timings and uh, different amounts of days. And I'm saying that really there's only eight day holidays. Well, it's very simple. Um, you'll see the source. It's actually good you don't see the sources. The Ramban, um, which is perhaps after Rashi, the most popular commentary on the Chumash, um, there are sections in the Ramban that everybody skips. 
and that's the Kabbalistic sections. Um, even Kabbalists skip this section because the, the Kabbalah that is well known and studied in our days is what's in academic circles called Lurianic Kabbalah, Lurianic for Rav uh, Yitzhak Luria, the Ari. Um, the Ari, anybody who has any connection to Kabbalah knows that the Ari really redefined, recreated on some level the Kabbalah. Um, and that's what people study, by and large. Um, so Ramban is pre-Ari, and so he's saying things that are uh, very difficult to understand. So as a result, we skip these sections. But one of the things he says in discussing the holidays is that he feels that, in fact, Shavuot is not really a separate holiday, but rather Shavuot serves the same function for Pesach as Shemini Atzeret does for Sukkot. Okay, so there already, you may see what I'm getting to, that really they're not, I, I, I recently wrote an article on this, and I said, you know, just like people have two legs, the regalim also are two regalim, they're two, two feet, two legs, and they are Pesach, which Shavuot is really a part of, and there's Sukkot, which is the other holiday, where, where Oshmin Atzeret is the end of that. One of the proofs that he gives to this idea is that the word Atzeret in the Gemara never refers to Shmini Atzeret. It actually refers to Shavuot. Um, and then he says, well, what do you do with you know, the 49 days, which really minus Pesach, it's less than 49 days. What do you do with all those days? So he said, very simple, it's Chol HaMoed. So essentially what the Ramban says is we're in Chol HaMoed right now, right on a Kabbalistic level, but Kabbalistic doesn't mean nonsense. It means that it's beyond the immediate understanding of most people. Nonetheless, says the Ramban, we're involved in Chol HaMoed. So if we're involved in Chol HaMoed, essentially we're talking about a happy time, right? I mean, that's uh, the happiest time of the year. You, not only do you have uh, the benefits of the themes of the holidays, but you can drive out, go out to your limb, do all sorts of uh, fun things, right? listen to bands. So it seems like a happy time. Okay, so the obvious problem with this is why did, uh, why did God do what he did with the students of Rabbi Akiva specifically during this time period. And as we know, the Jewish calendar usually works according to themes. There are happy times, there are sad times. In other words, uh, we know the tragedies generally happen in the summer around Tisha B'Av and, and Tammuz, Chodesh Tammuz, Chodesh Av. Um, so the Maral is aware of this issue. We'll see it in a second, what the Maral has to say. Before we do that, I want to see the Gemara that the Maral is addressing. That's the, you just got your short sheet, so you can skip down to the second, uh, actually the third source. There's Yivamot, you can read, follow in the Hebrew or in the English, whatever works for you. Um, over there a, is the famous discussion about what happened to Rabbi Akiva's students. So over there it says, Rabbi Yeshua Omer, Nasa Adam Isha B'yaldoto, Isha B'zikmato. Right, if a person married when he was young, he should marry again when he's old. Uh, meaning if his first wife dies. He shouldn't say, okay, I did my, you know, I did my job. So he quotes a pasuk in Kohelet, and he says, uh, same thing about Marrying twice, you should have children when you're young, but also when you're older. Uh, and he quotes this verse of Shlomo, the wisdom of Solomon, that uh, he gives a example, metaphor, you should plant in the morning and the evening, right, the morning of your life, the evening of your life, uh, and don't stop your hand, because you don't know which is going to be better, right, this one or that one, maybe they'll both be good, but I'll just keep going, Right? Keep producing. Uh, it never ends. Right? You're always supposed to be doing things. Don't, there's no such thing as retirement 
in Judaism. It's, I think, the <laughs> upshot of this. Jews don't retire. Uh, they may stop being involved in the career or the job they're in, but they still have to be productive. And um, for our purposes, this is applied to learning by Rabbi Akiva. And he says as follows, Rabbi Akiva, Omer, Lamad Torah, Torah B'yaluto, Yilmod Torah B'ziknuto. If you studied as a youth, keep on studying when you're older. Hayulo Talmidim B'yaluto, Yulo Talmidim B'ziknuto. And if uh, you were teaching Torah as a youth and you had students when you were young, do it again to new students when you're older. Then quotes the same verse that we saw before. Uh, so now the famous story, So Rabbi Akiva had students all over the land of Israel, right, 24,000, 12,000 pairs. Uh, they all died in a certain time period because they didn't honor each other. And the world was desolate. Uh, at which point Rabbi Akiva came to uh, our teachers who weren't yet our teachers but who became our teachers who were living in the south the Shinalehem and Rabbi Akiva at that point taught them who were they Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon the, Rabbi Shimon by the way is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai uh, which is going to be important later Rabbi Lazar, Elazar ben Shamoah they're the four, the, uh, four students that, uh, that <coughs> kept Torah alive, the preserved Torah. And then we find out when was the time period that they died. It was from Pesach to Shavuot. We're going to come back to this Gemara. That's an interesting Gemara. Context is important. right? We're not just taking a story, but rather we're saying in the context of keep going, keep producing. Why? You don't know what's going to bear the better fruit, whether it's the early work, the later work. And by the way, you see this with artists as well as uh, writers and rabbis even. Uh, some people produce more when they're younger and some people produce more when they're older. Um, in terms of the, the, you know, one would think that rabbis always get better with age. Uh, but uh, it's not always true in terms of writing. For example, Rav Cook's most creative period was when he was in, in Yafo, when he was in his 40s. As he became the chief rabbi in Israel, he was too busy and too involved. And the generation had changed. He wasn't getting the same. That the, the, A lot of the work of Rav Cook is coming as a response to other people who are challenging him um, in the early 1900s, the late uh, 1800s, there was a lot of a lot, a lot in the air. Um, with World War One, uh, there was a lot of disillusionment. People weren't thinking and, and creating and challenging so much. It was a very different feel, and therefore that didn't provide the uh, you know the the oomph for of Cook to respond and, and and be as creative. So it's true with anyone who's involved in any sort of creative activity. Sometimes your early period is the more creative period, and sometimes the later period is uh, the more creative period. In any case, that's the, uh, that's the idea. And as I said, we're going to get back to this because I think it's important in terms of what we're talking about this evening. Uh, on the second side, right, still the uh, first page, the Maharal asks our question, what's going on? Why is God doing this in this time period? And his answer is not going to be what I'm going to answer. But what he does say, if you look in the, um, in the second line, he says, even though it's the best of times, right? He, it, you know, it's, it's a kasha, it's a kushya. It's something that requires being asked and answered. We need to know. It doesn't make sense. This is not, you know, as if there's punishment to be given, if God is going to punish the Jews, there has to be a reason to do it at that point. It's like during, during, during Sukkot or during Pesach. Right? Uh, Pasnished. So there has to be an answer to this. And over the course of my talk, I'm going to try to give an answer for this. I'm going to go to the next uh, source, also on that page, Gemara Makot. It's on the uh, page three in English as well. So again, you can follow either in Hebrew or in English. Famous Gemara. 
anybody who's ever studied Makot and done it, uh, has made a siyum, this is what people are uh, finished with. And uh, it talks about famous, again, yeah, the Gemara is famous, I'm sure many of you, perhaps most of you have heard it before, uh, but perhaps you've never really thought about some of the issues that are brought up by this, uh, by this particular Gemara. Uh, it's the story of Rabbi Kiva and his colleagues coming to Jerusalem from viewing the, the Temple Mount from Hart Sophim, right, uh, Mount Scopus, and coming close to the Temple Mount. So the Gemara relates as follows. Shuv Pamechat, actually before we start the Gemara, there's a couple of things I want to tell you about Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva is obviously the central figure. He also appears in the title, right? So you have to give some deference to Rabbi Akiva. Um, first of all, getting back to the idea of Lag Baomer, which is coming up, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, as we mentioned before, is a student of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is known as the author of the Zohar, at least the, the precursor of the Zohar, the father of mysticism. And uh, his Rebbe was Rabbi Akiva, right? That means that Rabbi Akiva taught Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai uh, Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah. Um, so obviously Rabbi Akiva is also a mystic. Uh, once we realize that I think we can have a better understanding of why he says things that appear rather strange uh, at first glance. Mysticism is, again, about seeing something beyond uh, or beneath the surface. So that's the first thing I want you to know about Rabbi Akiva. Uh, the second thing is in line with that, another famous Gemara, and that's Gemara in Brachot, uh, where Rabbi Akiva, I'm not even going to tell the story because you probably all have heard it, but Rabbi Kiva comes to this town with his donkey and the fire and, and so on and so forth, and he's denied lodging in the town. Um, and uh, as one catastrophe happens to him after another, um, he keeps on saying, Kol da Avid Rahmana Latava Avid, which means anything that God does, he does for the good. So Rabbi Kiva accepts one catastrophe after the other and uh, says, you know, it must be for the good. And the end, it ends up being all, f all for the good because uh, there happens to be a raid uh, of brigands on the town that he was going to sleep in. And had he had his, uh, his light blew out, the, the brigands couldn't see him. They might have attacked him. He had various animals which might have made noise. And because of all these catastrophes, he was saved from something uh, much worse. Uh, the moral of the story is exactly what Rabbi Kiva said, which is shown to, in fact, be the case that everything that God does, even though things may appear bad, are really for the good. It's important to understand the context of that story, that it's specifically Rabbi Akiva saying it. In other words, the Gemara is not, it could be a lot of rabbis said uh, things like that, but when Rabbi Akiva said it, it has tremendously more importance. Why? Because Rabbi Akiva uh, suffered through most of his life, a tremendously difficult life. His children died, obviously we saw that his, his Talmidim died. Um, he himself is a very interesting story, which is less known than, than some others about the dialogues between Rabbi Akiva and his main teacher, Rabbi Eliezer. Um, not for tonight, but uh, one of the things that, uh, that happens along the way is, is Rabbi Lazar is distanced by the other rabbis. He gets put, he gets excommunicated. And at the very end of, the, of his life, so they remove the excommunication. Uh, because Rabbi Kiva went along with the other rabbis, Rabbi Lazar is, is not pleased with him, nor with the other rabbis, and essentially uh, curses all of them uh, and uh, tells Rabbi Kiva that his death is going to be more gruesome than any of the other uh, rabbis. Uh, meaning, for our purposes, again, it's a very interesting Gemara. Uh, I'm giving a, a, a particular rendition of it, but I think it's true to the text. Um, in any case, my point is that Rabbi Eliezer, after this interaction, excuse me, Rabbi Akiva, after this interaction with his teacher, lived under the shadow of death. Meaning, he knew that he was going to die in an unpleasant way from that point on. It's interesting in that uh, situation, Rabbi Kiva nonetheless goes and teaches Torah when he knows that he could be very easily killed by the Romans for doing so. In fact, that's how he does meet his death. And uh, Rabbi Kiva 
continues nonetheless. In any case, that's a little bit of context. There's a lot more to say about Rabbi Kiva, but it's not the main focus of our discussion this evening. So we'll suffice with that and go back to the story in Makot, uh, which reads as follows, Shufam Echat Hayo Olin Leyushalayim Kevan Shegiyu Laharat Sofim Kavu Bigdehem So, <coughs> Rabbi Kiva and his colleagues were walking to Jerusalem. They got to Mount Scopus, Scopus and they all tore their clothing, right? Rabbi Kiva also tore his clothing. As Rabbi Kiva is living in this world, even if he's able to see things beyond this world, he still lives in this world, he still feels sadness emotionally when he sees the temple uh, destroyed and a, a temple mount without an active temple on it. Once they went further and they came close to the actual inner sanctum of the Beit HaMikdash, the Kadosh Kadoshim, uh, they saw fox coming out. So they did the normal thing. They cried, and he did something strange. He laughed, right? So, uh, so they said to him, why are you laughing? So they said back to him, right? Jews always answer with a, qu- a question with a question. So, so, so why, are you, uh, why are you crying? So they said, you know, this is such a holy place. In the Torah it says that even uh, Azar, here Azar, Azar means a foreigner. It means a non-Kohen. It doesn't mean a, a non-Jew. Even someone who's not a Kohen, uh, who goes to the, I mean, Kal V'chomer, the Kadosh Kadoshim, it's, it's only the Kohen Gadol. Right? So, no one goes here. And if they do, they're, they're killed. And now we see little foxes coming out. How can we not cry upon seeing this? Amr Lahan said back to them, L'chach ani mitzachek. That's exactly why I'm laughing. D'chtiv ve'ida li edim nemanim et uriya kohen v'tzachariya ben yivrachiyahu. So he says, I'll tell you why, because there's a verse that speaks about two men that will be witnesses for me, God says. Um, <clears throat> and these two men are Uriah, who's a Kohen, and Zechariah, uh, who is uh, another personage. Says, uh, <clears throat> says Rabbi Kiva, it's a very strange verse because it's speaking about two people that shouldn't be coming together. They lived in different time periods. So Ella. So rather, the verse is coming to teach us an idea. What's the idea? That one prophecy is dependent on the other. So by Uriah, it's written that Jerusalem will be like a plowed field, meaning it will be destroyed uh, and covered over. But by the other, it's written by Scharia, it's written that old men and women will sit in the open plazas, right? Rechovot here being plazas, right? Which is an indication of tranquility, right? In other words, old people are more vulnerable to uh, attacks and, and things of the like. So if it's dangerous, they're the last people going to be out there. But uh, there's going to be tranquility for Jewish old, elderly in Jerusalem. Uh, says Rabbi Kiva then a very strange thing. Again, people read this Gemara all the time without really thinking what the implications are. Says, He says, once, until the first prophecy of destruction was accomplished, I was afraid that the second prophecy of uh, salvation would not be accomplished, right? Now that I see that it was accomplished, right? Uh, <clears throat> now it's clear that the second prophecy of redemption will be accomplished, will come to pass. And then they say, Say you've consoled us. But what's going on? I mean, the, I'm not the only person to ask the question, or the first one to ask the question. Uh, Rabbi Kiva is a pillar of faith. Uh, he is one of the greatest rabbis who ever lived. 
And he says, I wasn't sure if this prophecy was going to come true. Right? It sounds like, you know, remember teaching uh, high school and junior high school and the kids going, come on, Rabbi, we don't really believe that. You don't you believe that, Rabbi? Uh, Rabbi Q is saying, I, I'm not sure. You know, there's two prophecies. And until the first one came true, I had my doubts about the second prophecy. It's very strange. The Eitz Yosef uh, commentary on the... Um, Ein Yaakov, the Ein Yaakov, which is uh, a collection of the Gemara's Agadot, uh, asks this question and gives the following answer without explaining it, uh, explaining his answer. He says that Rabbi Kiva uh, felt that it was impossible to get to Geula without Korban, that a condition for Geula, for the complete redemption, Right, was destruction along the way. Right? In other words, they couldn't continue as things were and avoid these type of calamities of one type or of another and still get to what we call Yemot HaMashiach, to the times of Mashiach where uh, we'll live in a completely more elevated and protected state. So that's uh, that's the Eitz Yosef. As I said, he doesn't really explain himself. So, to explain the Eitz Yosef, um, I turn to our philosopher on the page, to uh, Georg Hegel, um, who is not trending these days, and some people uh, <laughs> don't like him, uh, but certainly had profound things to say. And my feeling, we'll, we'll see uh, uh, that Rev. Cook says very similar things to Hegel. Uh, my feeling is that he's really giving a proper understanding of the Gemara that we have just seen. So if that's correct, he's essentially explaining and speaking out what Rabbi Kiva was trying to tell us in the Gemara. Uh, and perhaps it's, a, it's an obvious idea, perhaps we are familiar with it, but wasn't always and, and is not necessarily an obvious idea for many people. I, I don't claim to be an expert in Hegel, but I've read enough of his philosophy and history to feel that these, these uh, quotes that I have are, are representative of, uh, of his ideas. And we take a quick look at what he says, the first paragraph, uh, he says that change, while it imports dissolution, involves at the same time the rise of a new life. That while death is the issue of life, life is also the issue of death. Right? Read Geula and Chorban, if you will. Spirit, consuming the envelope of its, of its existence, does not merely pass into another envelope, nor rise rejuvenescent from the ashes of its previous form, comes forth exalted, glorified, pure spirit. It certainly makes war upon itself, consumes its own existence, but this very destruction works up uh, with existence into a new form. I'm sorry, in this very destruction it works up with existence into a new form, and each successive phase becomes in its turn material, working on what it exalts, on which it exalts itself to a new grade. Uh, so essentially what Hegel's saying is that there's progress in history, and that this progress it comes about by destruction along the way, the various phases, and uh, it's called historical dialectics, right? That there's a certain way, a certain culture that lives a certain way, and uh, it's combated by another culture, which uh, often destroys the first culture, and then there's a third culture with, uh, which uh, comes to some sort of synthesis. But this is a pattern that happens over and over again. By the way, the uh, the ashes that he's referring to, this is uh, an allusion to the mythical phoenix. Right? The mythical phoenix bird was a bird that was supposed to uh, end its life by going up into fire, and from these ashes, a new phoenix would be born. Uh, Hegel says uh, explicitly that history is, is greater than a phoenix. Because the phoenix is sort of a Greek cycle, and it's a sort of fatal cycle that keeps on repeating itself. Whereas the phoenix is more Jew. I mean, the, the history is more Jewish. Um, Kale, Thomas Kale, in his, his book, The Gifts of the Jews, 
So one of the things they describe as the gift that the Jews have given to mankind is the idea of progress, that things move forward. Um, so I don't know if Cahill, where, where he decided that was the case, but I think he's correct. And I think that's what Hegel is talking about. And I think that Cahill is right, that if that's what Hegel is, is talking about, that he's really borrowing ultimately a Jewish idea. The novelty in, he in, in Hegel is how do you get to the various stages of progress. And what Hegel says, and this is why it's relevant to our Gemara here, is Hegel says there's no other way to progress uh, except through destruction. Right? Again, he brings the myth of the phoenix. The phoenix burns up. Um, how much destruction, you know, how often is a different question, but there has to be some destruction in order to uh, bring about novel and better stages, and that's really the point. Uh, I'm not going to read the next paragraph, but it's interesting, you can read it on your own. Uh, essentially what Hegel says over there um, is that there has to, that his theories about history are motivated by theodicy, by a, an, an, a, essentially a need to justify the acts of God in our world or in anything that's created by God, anything that God does. Um, and history sometimes looks pretty bad. And anybody who feels, again, Hegel's uh, idea of God may, may not be our idea of God, but nonetheless, um, whether you have his idea or I, our idea, the same questions come to the fore. And that is, how can a good God allow such evil to happen? Uh, how does he allow or even actually bring the evil to happen? And uh, that's why, uh, sorry, there's some more. Oh, sorry, was he Jewish? No, no, he's not Jewish. So um, I think we can have ideas uh, that are parallel from people who are not coming from the same uh, theology. I mean, there's a lot of ideas that are similar in, in Judaism and, and contemporary philosophy, um, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not inventing that, as I think a lot of, of people have. Don't we use a joke like looking in the car to find out philosophy? Well, all you have to do is, I mean, the famous example is the Rambam. Um, I've been translating the Rambam recently, uh, a lot of his works, and um, the Rambam quotes verbatim um, from Aristotle. Um, he doesn't think that that's a problem. He thinks there's a lot of wisdom that Aristotle is offering, which are, again, parallel to Torah ideas. So that's, if it's good enough for the Rambam, it's good enough for me. Um, in any case, <laughs> correct, okay, that's right, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Just one question, the, the story with the fox, <clears throat> in terms of historically, <clears throat> does that happen after the destruction of the base of Mikdash and before the Bar Kokhba rebellion? Well, it definitely happens after the destruction, whether it's before right. or after Bar Kokhba is not clear. My sense is it's before, because right. it sounds pretty fresh. It sounds yeah. pretty fresh, but there's, the Gemara doesn't generally right. tell us the chronology, which is actually an interesting exercise in uh, trying to create some sort of chronology in Rabbi Akiva's statement. It's yeah. a very interesting thing, and unfortunately, um, I don't think we're ever going to know, uh, which, which will make a difference in, in various, uh, various things. But, um, but in any case, the, the, the novelty of Hegel, and again, um, it, we can see it again in Rav Kook, and I think it's exactly what Rav Yikiv is saying. Um, I remember, I think, Rav Lichtenstein once telling us that um, sometimes religious ideas that are in the Torah are more easily accessible through foreign sources, in other words modern writers might be speaking more in our language than Chazal. Uh, you know, that's simply the reality. Whether it's good or bad is a different question, but they're, they're, they speak more our language, and they're talking very similar or the same ideas, and therefore... Uh, You've heard of Rabbi uh, Fackenheim? Yeah, yeah. He yeah, was a great Hegel scholar. Was he? I didn't realize that. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. okay. um, but I think he found Hegel as a stumbling block because Hegel you know, for the Shoah. Right, a lot of, a lot of, yeah. I mean, again, a lot of the post uh, 
Holocaust theologians and, and those influenced by them, right, have, have an issue. Uh, I mean, the, the big question, the, the, the big issue with that is whether there's really exceptionalism about the Shoah. I, mean, I think that's, a, that's more of an emotional response than anything else of, of people who, uh, who live through it. Um, I'm not sure that uh, the Chorban of Yerushalayim, um, you know, if, if they were happy with the answers given before the Shoah, I'm not sure why they should be uh, unhappy afterwards, except that they lived through it. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but certainly, that's definitely, you know, not just among Jews, but among philosophers and, and uh, uh, people coming in, in uh, post-World War II in terms of one of the reasons Hegel sort of became much less popular, but there's been a resurgence in, in, in Hegel since uh, in the last 30, 40 years. Um, in any case, um, what I would say just to bring this a little closer to home uh, in terms of trying to understand this idea of destruction being necessary for redemption. Sorry, I didn't get that. <laughs> okay. I'll repeat it. <laughs> That's a great prompt. I have to that one. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, the um, the example that I was thinking of is uh, many of you have children or uh, know other people that do, um, or remember what it was like to be a child. Um, you know, learning how to ride a bike, and things of that nature inevitably meant uh, falling once or twice. Um, there's simply, you know, the, the parent that always held on, you know, would never allow the kid to learn how to ride the bike. And so there was always a point where the parent would have to let go. And, and not too soon after that, eventually most children, uh, I'm sure everybody has perfect children who never fall, but <laughs> most children, um, you know, I include myself, more, you know, I remember the falls, or at least one of them. Uh, uh, you know, we fall, and, and that's the way to learn. Um, it simply doesn't happen any other way. And I think that um, this goes along with what the Mitzvah's understanding of exactly the procedure of what happened through the 40 years in the desert. Um, is that there was a choice to live a miraculous existence in history or to live a natural existence in history. And the break in the paths were with the sin of the scouts. In other words, uh, before, during, and after, there was a choice to live superhumanly as they had in Egypt with God constantly uh, doing everything for them. Um, for which they needed to live on a very, very high level, which was ultimately unattainable at that point in time, or to live in history and live according to the rules of history. Um, once they chose the latter, there was no other way but to, just like a child learns through accidents and mishaps, that nations also learn through accidents and mishaps, and there's simply no other way. In other words, to get to the final result, to get to where we want to go, there had to be calamities along the way. And essentially, that's what Rabbi Akiva was saying over here in, um, in the Gemara in Makot. Um, as I mentioned before, these ideas are found in Rav Kook as well. Rav Kook uh, lived after Hegel. Um, and some suggest that he was influenced by Hegel. Um, I don't think that's the case. Um, he certainly knew about him. He knew about most of the current philosophers uh, that were current in his time, whether uh, alive or mostly who uh, had lived in previous generations, immediately previous generations. Um, as far as I can tell, Ruf Cook saw these ideas already in the Jewish mystical tradition. In the Kabbalah, which we said goes back through Rabbi Shemurai back to Rabbi Akiva, which is not, uh, according to my contention, co coincidental. I'm just going to look through a couple passages in Rav Kook, one's from Orat Kodesh, where he speaks about evolution. It's a fascinating uh, discussion. 
And I'm just going to skip very quickly through the third paragraph in, the, in that uh, piece, where he says, evolution sheds light on all the ways of God. All existence evolves and ascends. Again, the idea of progress, uh, as this may be discerned in some of its parts. It's interesting, this, uh, this little uh, uh, caveat here. Rav Cook says, you can't see it everywhere, but it exists everywhere. Now, it can be discerned in some of its parts, yet all existence uh, ascends. This is simply the way of natural world. Says Rav Cook, um, it reflects everything else as well, including human history. Also works according to such laws that move mankind, God's creation universe, forward and upward. Um, the next piece is a little bit more complicated, and I think it might be best just for me to say it outside. You can take a look at it later. But essentially, he speaks about uh, Hegelian dialectic in Jewish history, three time periods, three large time periods. Obviously, there are a lot of smaller time periods involved uh, in between. But he speaks about three great time periods, one which is the prophetic time period um, through the Second Temple ending towards the beginning of the Second Temple period, where the focus is on the big ideas. And you know that the Nevi'im rarely speak about specific halachot. They speak about big ideas. They speak about justice and, and fairness um, and uh, serving God and lofty ideals. Uh, <clears throat> that was one time period, and that was one approach. Uh, that ended with completely with the destruction of the Jewish state. And at that point, the sages came to the fore, Chamim, who focused not so much on the big ideas, but on the very small, picky on specifics of, you know, when God says to have children, how many children? What, what sex do they have to be, right? And all these, these things that we see in the Gemara. Um, and he says that, you know, those oppose each other and there'll be a final third stage where after the various friction that went from stage one to stage two, and then from stage two to stage three, will result in the end of time. Um, that's a phrase we've seen by Hegelian, Francis Fukuyama, speaks about the, the end of history. Um, in any case, the end of time is, or the end of history, from our way of looking at things, is the Messianic period. Uh, Rav Kook was a great optimist, and he saw amazing things in his life. Uh, and we all see amazing things in our lives, but uh, I think they're perhaps even more dramatic in his life than for most of uh, our lives. And uh, he felt that Messianic times were really just around the corner. Um, in any case, he felt that we were coming to this third time period where there would be a merger of these two things. Again, the historical thesis, antithesis coming together in, in this grand synthesis of, uh, of Jewish history. It's interesting, I, I bolded the last part, the soul of Moshe will, will reappear in the world. Uh, in the um, introduction to this piece, a fantastic piece, by the way, in Orot, uh, is that the only person who had it all was Moshe Rabbeinu. Right? He had the big picture and he had the details. And no one was able to get that since. Um, and, and, you know, we, he speaks, you know, to our time period where there's a frustration with the details, where, you know, people, whether it be, um, you know, the reform movement or whether it be kids that are going off the derech or whether it be, you know, many of us who uh, feel frustrated by the lack of the great ideals um, that are rare to be found in, in the study of Talmud and Gemara. This is Rav Kook. Uh, that's to be expected as we tran uh, transit into the final period at the end of Jewish history. And that's what he says. The soul of Moshe will reappear in the world through all of us. And that's uh, how he summarizes Messianic times. OK, so we've gone through various sources, and I want to bring them all back to our original question, and that's what are we supposed to do with all of these various holidays in this time period, which as we saw in the Ramban and the Maharal, 
are ultimately a happy time period. And as the bottom line, we ask, uh, is it a happy time or a sad time? Well, the bottom line answer is, uh, yes, it's a happy time. However, um, some bad things happened during this happy time. So what do we do with that? I'm going to try to do something with it. Um, before I do that, I just want to relate my personal experience as someone who lives in Israel to a transition that I find very difficult and, and even awkward. And that's the transition that we had earlier this week. I was still in Israel, um, but I didn't experience the transition as starkly as I do, or as I did when uh, my children were in uh, religious Zionist youth groups, uh, where the custom, for a variety of reasons, mostly practical reasons, is to hold a Yom Zikaron Tekes, uh, how do you say Tekes? Uh, ceremony. ceremony, thank you. A, a Yom Zikaron ceremony right before Yom Hatzma'ut, because it's still Yom Zikaron. Um, and it's obviously appropriately sad, you know, poetry, whatever is, is, uh, is said. Um, candles are lit and prayers are said. And then, uh, you know, a couple minutes later, we're, you know, celebrating Yom Ma'ut, you know, in the same group. And it's very strange and difficult. Uh, I wouldn't have thought of, I mean, Yom Ma'ut happened when it did. Had I been uh, legislating and discussing and trying to determine when to make Yom Ha'zikaron, I would not have said it to make it Erev Yom Ha'atzma'ut, the day right before Yom Ha'atzma'ut. However, um, nothing is accidental, and I think this too can fit into the type of dynamic that we're speaking about. Uh, because really what we're speaking about in this time period, Sfirat Omer is a time of building ourselves, right? the, the various Sfirot that we relate to in the 49 days between Pesach and Shavuot, and in general, it's viewed as a time of preparing oneself to be on a higher level for the wheat offering that's given on Shavuot, for Kabbalah the Torah. Uh, the lesson, I think, of the various sources we've seen is that in our world, in the natural world that the Jews have chosen, the way to growth comes with mishaps, comes with accidents, comes with things that are not so pleasant. Uh, and that's not something to mourn in the larger scheme of things. Obviously, like Rabbi Akiva, when we see it, we tear our clothes. And that's why there are uh, customs of mourning during this time period. We don't uh, listen to music or cut our hair or whatever. And it's appropriate to relate to what happened nonetheless on that level. But one has to also have Rabbi Akiva's understanding that something greater going on, which is very fitting into his idea that call the Abid Rahman Tava Avid. This is part of a good process, a process of building and of redeeming. And it appears to me, going back to the first Gemara that we saw, uh, that we celebrate on Lag Baomer, the life and the accomplishments of Rav Shimon Bar Yochai, that one might ask, had the 24,000 students not have died, would Rav Shimon Bar Yochai have come to the scene at all? Uh, I think it's an interesting question, and I'd suggest that the answer is probably no. In other words, Rabbi Kiva only came to Rav Shimon Bar Yochai and his colleagues because the first attempt failed. Um, it's interesting that, according to Kohelet, that he should have done that regardless. But that's not how... The story seems to run, the story seems to run that it was a reaction to needing to do something else because there was, there was nothing else available. Um, is it tragic that we lost 24,000 uh, Talmudic Chamim of the First Order? Absolutely. There's no question about it. Um, but, like many other things in our history, one can uh, not be the ultimate judge and one has to trust, as Rabbi Akiva trusted, that ultimately the direction is the correct direction in the larger scheme of things. Finally, uh, you know, relate to Pasuk, we say all the time when on, on Shabbat before we bench, 
Hazorim uh, Bedima Berina Yitzaru, that those that uh, sow with tears, so they're the ones that are going to reap in joy. Um, I would suggest that similar to what uh, his son Shlomo said, that David the father was saying similarly, but perhaps more profoundly, that the only way, the requirement for reaping in joy is in fact the tears of the sowing, that there's no other way but the tears of sowing. And uh, my wish and prayer is that we're done with that part and that we'll only be commemorating the sad part and that we've, uh, we've done enough of the growing, but uh, you know, that's uh, beyond us and something that we have to do our best to try to build and show Kadesh Baruch Hu that we're, we're there already and we don't need any more mishaps. We don't need to fall off the bike anymore. We know how to, how to ride the bike. So with that bracha and that wish, I'll end, and uh, I'll certainly take any questions that anybody uh, wants to ask. Yeah. <clears throat> you left out, I doubt by mistake, a very important part of Rabbi Akiva's history as the spiritual leader of the Bar Kokhba revolt. Yeah. Um, and there is another view of why his students died. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. that they were hunted down and killed by the mm -hmm. Romans. Right, that's what you mean. And that the Omer, in a way, celebrates or remembers tragically the loss of Jewish sovereignty, not just simply the loss of twenty-four thousand, which mm -hmm. is tragic. Mm -hmm. But that was the end of sovereignty until sixty-nine years mm -hmm. ago. Right. So one would wonder if what Rabbi Akiva actually saw was that regaining of sovereignty when he left. That, that's, that it wasn't, you know, simply uh, the Gullus, but, you know, what we're living in now, where sovereignty has been regained. And I would argue that maybe the Omer is due eventually to return to its previous glory uh, in a world in which the Jews have sovereignty over their own nation. Okay. Definitely a legitimate possibility. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, well, you want to ask one question and then go to another? I want another question, totally different question. Mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, going back to um, Hegel, well, he has a grand plan for everything, right? But does Ralph Cook see this grand plan? You know, Hegel, the history will end, in t but does Rav Cook see that? I'm just reading from the bits you have here. Is it, is it you're really saying it's this, the same, like, especially the last, I don't quite understand the soul of Moshe will appear in the world. But the, um, does it tie into Hegel? You're saying it's influenced by Hegel? or So again, many people suggest that it's influenced by Hegel. I mean, certainly knew of Hegel and certainly was saying things that are similar to Hegel. That doesn't necessarily mean influence. Again, he, uh, Rav Cook, speaks about uh, these ideas as, as uh, coming out of the Kabbalah. Uh, but there's certainly obvious, very strong parallels, and uh, he's definitely incorporating very similar ideas in terms of his view of, of Jewish history, that it's, uh, it's uh, again, dialectical process that involves uh, serious it's a destruction, but uh, serious problems along the way. So Everything is synthesized in Hegel. Antithesis, synthesis, antithesis. Yeah. So, I mean, that, again, that's, it's, it seems, again, you can look at the, the, the essay as a whole. It's not a long, long essay, but I think that's pretty much what Ruth Cook is, uh, is seeing in Jewish history. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that the, uh, the 19th century was an exciting time to uh, be into philosophy, right. certainly. I mean, this, you, you introduced uh, this lecture with that. Um, but uh, I think that the drawback um, with uh, sweeping theories like Hegel's or anybody else's is um, it, it promotes a very selective um, um, synthesizing of, of the facts that you have out there. And, um, uh, you know, I'm not 
so postmodern as to say that there's no correct or <laughs> incorrect way of doing it. Um, but um, the drawback of that is that uh, there's a trap in believing that you have it all you, you have you have it all figured out. And um, I think you know within you know within our own circles you know there's a mini dialectic between this kind of thinking and for example Rabbi Mittal, who would uh, at the end he started to say that you shouldn't figure out try to figure out. Um, um, and when he used to say that, he was directly um, referring to the Kokianim, you know, who uh, very much uh, were into were into these kinds of sweeping uh, mm -hmm. uh, analyses of, of the direction of history and, and, and where it's headed. And he said, well, you know, actually, if you look at it, take another look at it. Nothing really. The outcome of, of, of nothing since the Nevi'im Achronim really turned out exactly the way mm -hmm. the Nibiyim or the Soferim or Kazal, you know, or Rishon or Marachon Achron described that it would be. Right. So, yeah. yeah um, so I'm not familiar with that particular statement of, of Rabbi Tal, but uh, certainly what the Nibiyim say have many different ways of being interpreted, and uh, it, it certainly quite true that what we expected to come out didn't necessarily uh, reflect what, what, what did come out. It's not necessarily saying the same thing as as, uh, as the words of the Nevi'im. Again, this is very similar to what Rabbi Ki was saying. I didn't expect them to, to come true. So um, I think we understand that the, the statements of the prophets, uh, again, positive statements, certainly uh, need to come true. Whether we understand them or not is, is a different is a different story, and certainly, you know, the critique you make of the mainstream, uh, I, mean, I don't know if the mainstream is, is the correct uh, way to describe them, but the students primarily of, of Rav Tzvi Yehuda Kuk, um, understanding of Rav Kuk's teaching, um, certainly uh, has that sort of grand sweeping uh, Approach to 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 them, but they what they're lacking is the greatness of Cook. In other words, I think it's one thing for Cook to have made, or Havdil Hegel to make uh, these type of sweeping statements. Um, you know, any theory that a person's going to come up with uh, in any discipline um, is open to the critique that that you've made, and that is that one will want to, once one has established a theory, to try to incorporate everything you see into that theory. A theory breaks down for the intellectually honest when there's too much that doesn't fit in. And I think that's the caveat that has to be taken in uh, with that. And again, the critique of the Holocaust is that that's exactly what happened. You know, that it, how can you say this idea? 